that what we could do with our time while I'm here is that we'll review some of the content that you've already seen. So today we're going to talk about chapters four and five. So we'll cover the content that was covered in, um, that was weeks, week two. And so we'll take about one hour to go over each chapter. So it will be just a real general overview. Okay, so you've already seen this content and we'll just have a little bit of discussion about it. So this is an opportunity for me to see how well you've internalized the content, if you have any other questions about it, any clarifications that you need. And then tomorrow we'll look at the content from week three. So that'll be chapter six and seven, okay? And then on today's Tuesday, Wednesday, so on Thursday, then we'll look at um, the content for week four. So we'll look at chapters eight and nine. And then on Friday, <coughs> we'll talk about the content for week five, which is chapters 10 and 11. I understand that you probably haven't read the chapters for week four, five, and six yet. But I'll just give an introduction to it, okay? So start to lay the groundwork so you can see the content. And then later you can read it and then you'll have your in-class discussion on, on Saturdays as usual, okay? And then on um, Saturday, We'll look at the content for week six, which is chapters 12 and 13, okay? So what we'll do is we'll spend about one hour on each chapter, pretty much just having a discussion and seeing the main points. And then um, the last hour, we're going to have the student presentations about vocabulary, right? So this week, the content for um, Week four is on lexicon, right? So we're starting to look at vocabulary and vocabulary acquisition. And so then how will we teach vocabulary, right? So um, ordinarily, CLA 2 has a presentation component to it. But what we did is we've separated it so it's not attached to CLA 2 this time. We'll do the presentation, take advantage of the fact that I'm here. So we can do it while I'm here and we can get some feedback and some interaction, okay? So, um, first of all, just a clarification about CLA-1. So CLA-1 is uh, for week four. So it's due this weekend, not day before yesterday, <laughs> right? Okay, so I apologize. I think on YAP it was marked for this last weekend. So it should be for next week. Okay, so I'll um, have them change that and move the link. Okay, so you can submit it for next week. Okay, and um, do you have any other questions for me before we get started with week four? Anything in general? Well, some links on the PowerPoint mm -hmm. cannot be accessed. So cannot be accessed? Mm -hmm. Really? Which PowerPoint? I don't remember. Oh. I click on it and Really? Many times. Yeah. And did you try and copy and paste the URL yes. and that doesn't work either? Mm -hmm. oh. Did you have it set up? Yeah, yeah, okay. So did you uh, uh, Universal Grammar Valley, not just here, again, it, it requires the password and I turned on that. Oh, I saw that when I was in GAP. I was going to ask about that. It says Vimeo and it asks for a password. Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. Those are the videos that I included. I think you asked for supplementary videos, remember? So um, that's what I've been doing every week is adding some supplementary videos. Are those the ones that you can't access? It's not in the PowerPoint, it's the extra ones, right? Is that it? Okay. I'll find out what the issue is. I don't know why there's a password there. I meant to ask, I saw that too. So that shouldn't be there. We'll get that fixed. Anything else? So let's start looking at um, chapter four then. So because 
we're starting at chapter four, we'll talk a little bit about the textbook in general and the course in general up to this point also. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Please let me know if uh, my voice is too low or if I talk too fast or something, okay? Um, and feel free to interrupt and talk because I want this to be more of a conversation than a lecture, all right? So um, on chapter four, they start to talk about um, the cognitive approach to language. Cognitive means what? What is it? Related to mental? Yeah, related to mental, right? It's your thinking process. And so what was the theory about language acquisition before the cognitive approach? Is it behavior? Right. Yeah, with behaviorism. And who's the major theorist that we associate with behaviorism? Skinner, right? Yeah. And so with behaviorism, the way this is uh, looking at psychology, right? So second language acquisition is a very interesting area because it overlaps with a lot of other domains, right? So if we look at SLA, and we can talk also about where you just mentioned behaviorism, and where does behaviorism come from? Like what, uh, if you were to go to the university and take a course on behaviorism, where would that course be located? In which program? Psychology, right? So in the study of psychology, we learn about language acquisition. In fact, for example, I did my doctorate in psychology, but I was studying language acquisition. So I didn't do my, my doctorate in SLA, it was in psychology. What other fields over, overlap with SLA? Linguistics. Linguistics. And would that overlap with psychology as well, or no? Yeah? How, how would it overlap? It might. I don't know. I can't think of an example. Can you think of an example? If you are, if you are really interested in the, in the language, uh -huh. in that language, you will uh, uh -huh. look at it. Sure. Okay. So inside psychology, we have a lot of components, right? So if you're interested, if you're motivated, right? So inside psychology, we can look at so many things, right? We can look at learning. Ability. Capability. Okay. So maybe intellect, right? Yes. Or ability. So linguistics, maybe it overlaps with psychology a little bit. How do we define linguistics? Linguistics is the study of what? Languages. Languages, right? And it's really breaking down the language, right? Looking at the grammar, at the syntax, at the pronunciation, really analyzing it at a very, very um, intricate, deep level, right? So it can overlap with psychology because it has to do with learning, right? So how do we learn languages? Well, maybe based on the grammar, we can look at different things. What else? What other fields might overlap with SLA? In the book, I see the word child language acquisition. Child language acquisition. So, also inside psychology, we have um, about uh, child development, right? So, child growth and child development. And child development also might be an area like in biology or something, right? So if we're talking about life sciences, so we're talking about how people grow, how they mature, they change when they become an adolescent, when they become an adult, right? So this influences psychology. We behave differently at different ages. And maybe we learn language differently. So when we're children learning our first language, we 
maybe that's different than when we're a teenager or an adult learning a, a first language or a second language, right? And what about the area of sociology? And I don't know where to put this because this sociology needs to overlap with psychology too, right? So, hmm, I'm not sure how to do this. This won't be very pretty, but <laughs> sociology. So what is sociology? It's the study of society, right? Of cultures, of different, uh, how people behave. And maybe a subset of sociology is anthropology, right? So, and anthropology also might overlap with uh, linguistics. So there might be more, right? So there's so many different areas that influence language acquisition. So this book uh, spends a lot of time looking at psychology. So it's looking at the learning process. How do we learn? And specifically, how do we learn languages, right? So they're kind of following a historical perspective, looking at the development of the field of psychology. So you mentioned behaviorism and Skinner. When was Skinner um, publishing? Do you remember? It was kind of the beginning of psychology. In the 50s, yeah, in the 1950s. So before that, we had Freud, right? We had Freudian psychoanalysis. But he didn't really talk about language. He was in the 1930s. And he was really the beginning of psychology. And after that, then we had Skinner in the 1950s, and he started talking about the mind and how we learn. And the theory of behaviorism is that we can't see inside the brain. We can never know what's going on inside the mind. They look at the mind like a black box. It was a mystery. We can't see it. So we can't say anything about it. That was their point of view. <coughs> so they only determined um, behavior based on what is observable. So you could see people's reactions to things. So let's say, for example, a child learns how to feed itself at a certain age. So behaviorism would say that they observed somebody doing it, and they learned by watching. And maybe they got reinforced. Like maybe the mom said, oh, good job. You're doing it all by yourself. That's great. So they feel encouraged, and they continue to do it. On the other hand, if they get punished, right, and the mom says no and smacks their hand, then they should stop doing that behavior. So like if they stick their finger in the outlet and the mom hits them, hopefully they won't do it again. Right? So this is how um, behaviorism describes language acquisition and all learning is that it's by reinforcement or by punishment we extinguish a behavior. And then there was somebody who started to argue with, Chong, with uh, Skinner. So we have Skinner, and that was behaviorism. That was in the 1950s. And then we, your book doesn't really talk about this guy too much. Usually in SLA, we talk a lot about this guy. But there was a guy who started to argue with Skinner. And he disagreed with him. And he said, no, you're wrong. It's not that simple. It's not that easy. Uh, children say things they've never heard before. So you can't explain it with behaviorism. They're not just imitating. They make creative responses. Do you know who this person was? Who? Passion? Who else? Lado. Anybody else? Chomsky. Got it. Chomsky. Yeah. He's one of my favorite guys. He's really interesting. He's a super interesting person. He's amazing. So this was back in the 1950s, and he started to correspond with Skinner. They started to publish papers disagreeing with each other.
Skinner would propose a paper and put it in a journal. It would be in a in a in a scientific journal, and Chomsky would publish another paper in reaction to Skinner and say, "No, you're wrong. It can't be." It was a it was an intellectual argument and a public intellectual argument. It was very interesting. And so, uh, what was Chomsky's theory? What did he say? How did he disagree with Skinner? Do you know, there, there's something specific that he mentions, and I don't know if you, your book doesn't really talk about this too much. It mentions it, but later on, not in this chapter, and it doesn't credit it to Chomsky, so it's kind of strange. <laughs> Any idea? Chomsky says that there is a universal grammar that means uh, the chariot uh, right, has uh, uh, the ability of learning every language in the world. Absolutely, yes. That is one of his theories. He talks about universal grammar, right? So um, I, I saw in the discussion board, I think there was a little bit of confusion about the concept of um, universal grammar. So, <laughs> universal grammar is what you said, exactly. It's that um, every child is born with the ability to learn any language that they are exposed to. Because they have some concept of grammar in their mind. It's not just repetition of what they hear in their environment. So universal grammar says that there is something universal about all languages. So for example, all languages have nouns and verbs. All languages have a concept of time. They can talk about past, present, future, somehow, right? They have some device to talk about time. Can you think of other things that might be universal to all languages? Gender? Okay. <coughs> so they have a way of describing a male and female, he and she. Some languages might have gender inside the language, like in French, you know, you would say le livre, right? So it's masculine, right? But in English, we don't have that concept of gender with objects, right? So that's something that's specific to certain languages. But there is the concept of gender, of being able to talk about men and women, his and her, so you would have pronouns that were represented. So these are just some examples. I think that there are like um, 12 principles that are universal to all languages. So he said that children are born hardwired to learn language. It's a human ability. It's a capability. It's not just behaviors. It's not just exposure. So he said that we have something in our mind, and it's called the, can you see down here, if I write down here? Yeah? The LAD. Have you seen this before? What's that? Okay. You talked a lot about that? Okay, great. So he said, inside your mind, every child is born with a language acquisition device. We have something in our brain that makes us able to understand language, to learn language and understand it. It's something unique to humans. They did a lot of experiments with apes, with primates, with dolphins, with bees. They have a method of communication, right? But they don't use words in the way that humans do. They're making some advances with primates, like it looks like primates are able to come up with some creative responses. They can, um, like for example, if you give them some food, they can say, oh, cold, right? Which is not just repetition of what it is. They're not explaining the object, but they're thinking and they can feel that the food is cold. So there's some evidence that there's some thought going in there. But it's obvious that they don't have an LAD like humans do. They have communication, but their language is different. So this is something specific to humans. So Chomsky disagreed with Skinner, and he said, no, it's not behaviorism. It's something different. There's more to it than that. So this is kind of the beginning of the cognitive approach. 
It's in our minds, right? We learn. So it's part of psychology. It's part of learning. So this textbook, and you have a chapter about this, has a lot of data, right? A lot of graphs, a lot of um, numbers that come from studies. And why do you think that this book focuses on that so much? What's the reason for that? They want to show the different, uh, different styles of language. Uh, okay. All right, that's what the way, I the way we convey the ideas in a sentence. We, want, we, we have the same idea, but uh, the way we put the words okay. are very different. Okay, so that could be a study. Let's say, for example, we want to do a study about the sequence of words, how we order words, and how it makes sense. So we do a study, and we find that um, 15 people do it this way, and 100 people do it this way. So then we can draw some kind of conclusion. Or if we see a hundred people do it, it's more common, right? So we can draw some kind of conclusion from this data, right? So this is the reason for presenting data. This is how we do science, right? This is how we create science, is through experiments, right? We conduct experiments and we see what the results are. And the results are usually numerical. So we get a certain percentage of people that do one thing and a certain percentage that do another. So this book relies heavily on evidence from scientific research in terms of how to support how second language acquisition occurs. So there's a heavy focus on research in this textbook. It's very important, in my opinion, for master's students to be able to understand research. You, as a master's student, you're a consumer of research, right? You read it, you need to understand it, you need to draw conclusions. Very terrible. It's really hard, right? Yeah, it's difficult. And I think specifically for us, who are people who focus on languages, we tend to be not so good with numbers, <laughs> right? Have you had that experience with your students? Sometimes they're really, really good at math, but they're not so good at languages, right? Or vice versa. So usually language teachers are not very good at math, right? There are exceptions. There are people who are good at both, right? There are people who are bad at both, <laughs> right? But in general, we don't like numbers too much, so we kind of feel like, oh, this is so boring and so hard to understand, right? But this is how science occurs. So this is how we're able to provide evidence and develop theories, right? So our theory is on, we don't know how language acquisition occurs, honestly. You know, like after all of this, we're still not sure. <laughs> that's, the, that's the sum of this, this whole course, right? So many different theories, so many different ideas. Each idea contributes a little bit to our understanding. So we do another study and we contribute some more, right? So we try and build this um, amount of data that helps us to understand the concept. It's a very, very complex concept, right? Whenever we're looking at something that is a social phenomenon inside the mind, there are so many different things that can contribute to it. We look at motivation, at learning, at intelligence, at your society, at the culture you grow up in, and your ability. So many variables. It's impossible to say, ah, this is the one thing that causes language acquisition. There isn't one thing. There are many, 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 many things. So by conducting research, we can feel more confident about what we say. But in science, we never know for sure. We never know 100%. Somebody can always come along and do another study and find an opposite result. So they find, uh-uh, what you said was wrong, like Chomsky did with Skinner. Right? It can happen. 
So people, maybe they believe Chomsky for 20, 30, 50 years, and suddenly somebody comes along and they find some new evidence that shows the opposite point of view. This is how science occurs, okay? So it's important for you as master's students to be able to understand research because you're at a scientific level. <laughs> so the problem with me in this one is not about the data. It's because of so many theories, so yeah. many hypotheses. Yeah. Right. Somebody said this, and then oh, I said oh, that, that's okay. And then I read another hypothesis. Oh, wow. Okay, it's completely opposite. Sure. So it's very hard for us. It's frustrating, right? It's frustrating. You think you understand, and then they come along and say no, that's not really true, <laughs> right? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're kind of studying history. So we're looking at the history of the theories about SLA. Well, this is what they thought in the 50s, and then this is what they thought in the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s, and bringing us up to date. And we're getting a clearer and clearer picture with the more and more studies that occur. No? <laughs> it's getting more and more confusing. Yeah. So, my advice to you would be, just relax. <laughs> Don't be so worried about it. You won't find one answer. You just won't. So, accept it. That's the way it is. It's like sometimes when your students ask you about grammar, and they say, well, why? Why do we use present perfect? You say, I don't know. You just do. <laughs> That's the rule. That you just do. There's no reason. Right? So sometimes students feel very frustrated because they want a good explanation. But why? Right? And sometimes there's no good answer. So the answer is we're just learning, you know, so take it easy, relax, be interested, be curious. Like, oh, interesting. Okay, well, they have a good point. Right? <laughs> oh, he has a good point too. Right? So that's the way this field goes, is it's very, very complex. Yeah. So um, in this master's program, you've probably noticed by now that we have some courses that are very theoretical, like this one. And we have some courses that are more practical, right? Like listening and speaking. That was more practical, right? It's like, how do you do this in the classroom? Next class, you're going to be taking uh, writing, right? Is it writing or reading? Writing. writing. So you're going to be taking writing. So how to teach writing. So those classes are very practical. But you need the theoretical courses too so that you understand what it is that you're doing when you apply the techniques. So you can remember, ah, from SLA, they said that this is a really good idea, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's important as a master student to have a good idea of the whole field it helps you to increase your confidence. You feel like you know a lot more than your students when they ask you a question, but why? You're able to give them some reasonable answer, right? Instead of, I have no idea. <laughs> okay? So it, it's difficult, right? A master's program is hard. It's uh, challenging. It's a lot of work. If it were easy, everybody would have one. <laughs> right? That's what's going to make you different than everybody else is that you stuck with this, right, for almost two years and you had to work really, really hard. Despite the fact that you're working and maybe have a family and other obligations, right? But this is the same everywhere. We were talking yesterday and I was explaining I have the exact same issue with my students in America. The same thing. They're mothers, they have families, they're working two jobs. They have to commute and spend three hours driving. You know, that's life nowadays. So it's hard. It's a very, very difficult period in your life. It's really, really hard. But it's worth it. You know, so there's a very, very good reward at the end, right? You really feel good about yourself. It's, it's really worth it. It's, I really encourage you to stick with it and do your best and work hard. It's really. Um, it's absolutely worth it. Yeah. I, ha I had um, a friend um, when she was doing her doctorate. 
So the doctorate's even worse, right? If you can imagine. That's like five years of this. Can you imagine? And you need to conduct research. You're not just a consumer of research, but you're doing research and publishing your results. Do you know the difference between a master's and a doctorate? What's the difference? Make the experiment and then uh, publish it in the uh, newspaper and magazine in the world, right? Yeah. And then the uh, right, other uh, well, doctors or other professors will judge them and give them the argument and they have to write a lot of articles. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's a requirement. Like once you have your PhD, yeah. you really should publish. And so you should publish in journals. Um, the, the main difference, though, is that you're responsible for proposing theory. In a master's, you might just do a um, very intensive study of one subject. But when you do a doctorate, you're responsible for proposing new theory. So that's another reason why we have so many ideas, right? Everybody comes up with their theory. Well, I think it happened this way. I don't know. I disagree. I think it happened this way. So you have to conduct some research, and um, the research should support your theory as to why you think it occurred that way. So I have this friend, when she was doing her doctorate, her husband took her computer and threw it out the window. <laughs> so she would do his work on her computer, right? She didn't That's give him any attention. <laughs> he was jealous. Yeah, he was jealous of her computer. It happened. Right? So it's really, really hard. I mean, when I was doing my doctorate, I think I slept like three hours a night. Wow. Yeah, for five years. Wow. Yeah, because I was working all day. I was working 12 hours a day. I was working from 8 in the morning until 10 at night. Yeah, I worked in like four or five different institutions. I'd go from one to another to another to another. It was crazy. And I had three little kids. Yeah, it was really hard. It was crazy. I swear, I only slept for three hours so a night for a long time. Suffer. Yeah, you have to be a little bit selfish, <laughs> right? It's like, I want this for me, right? And so they have to be understanding and helpful. It's hard. It's a real challenge. But it's absolutely worth it. So I really encourage you to do your best and you know, really pay attention. It'll, it'll be something that you'll be very, very proud of. And if you don't finish, to me, that's like one of the most terrible things, is to start something and not finish it. That drives me crazy. I can't. I need to like see everything through to the end. Uh, so it's really important. It's something that will kind of bother you all of your life. So, oh, I was doing it, but I couldn't. And to go back later is even worse. So this is the reason for so much data, is that data supports science. And so that's evidence of these theories. It's not just people's idea. Well, I think this. Well, I think that. Well, there's a reason. And the reason is because of the data. OK? Um, so a lot of these theories have been disproved, right? Like Chomsky, uh, Skinner, we don't really believe that too much anymore. But the thing is, is that there are certain elements small components from behaviorism that still apply. Can you think of an example? How do we use behaviorism today? It's not entirely thrown in the trash can. We still use it a little bit. Do you mean in learning languages or in daily lives? Either way. Yeah, we use it a lot for discipline, don't we? Classroom management, right? Yeah, like we say, class, 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 and everyone has to keep quiet. Sure, exactly. So they know, right, when you give this stimulus, that is their response, okay. right? They know they need to be quiet. And if they don't, right, they could get in trouble, right? Sometimes we give candies or a prize if, they, if we have a competition or something. So we try and reward the behavior that we're looking for. So it still has its place, right? It is still effective. So this is the thing. It's like, um, what's the best, me best method for teaching English? 
there's lots and lots of different methods, right? You have the reflex approach, you have um, total immersion, like if you go and just live in the United States. There's lots and lots of different ways of learning a language. You can learn all by yourself, just by reading, by studying. What's the best way? Is there one way that's the best? No. No. Right? There's no one best method. Everything has a little bit of validity. Everything is good for somebody. Maybe you're an introvert and you really, really like to read. But you're an extrovert and you like to learn by talking to people. You like to go out and make friends and travel. Well, that's good for you. But it's not good for you because you like to stay alone and be quiet and read. Right? So what works for you won't necessarily work for her. So there's no one best method, and there's no one theory about SLA. There are many, many theories, and all of them contribute a little bit. So that's what makes this field so complex. Okay, so getting into the content of the chapter a little bit. So they talk a little bit about the concept of negative transfer and positive transfer. This would be transfer from your L1. What does that mean? Remember these concepts? Just guess. You don't need to look in your book. <laughs> look at the word. Yeah, really. Use your mind. What do you think of the word transfer? What does that mean to you? Okay. Okay. Okay, exactly, exactly. So a positive transfer is when you transfer something from your L1, and it's right, it's successful, right? Whereas negative transfer, you transfer something from your L1, but it's not the same in the L2, so it causes a mistake, right? Um, so are there any things that you transfer from Vietnamese to English? Are there any things that are similar that you can take advantage of? Part of speech. So you have these language universals, right? You have noun verbs, you know, right? So if you know them in your mother tongue, it's easier to understand them in a second language. Have you ever had the experience of teaching grammar to somebody and they don't know grammar in their native language? Yeah, like they've never studied grammar formally. So they have no idea about nouns and verbs or prepositions. It's a great challenge to <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, it's a challenge to us too, right? <laughs> so it's like you're teaching grammar in both languages. They don't know it in their L1, so they can't transfer that knowledge. Of course they know how to use it, but they don't understand it um, at a higher level. Right, they know how to use it, but they can't label it. They just repeat what you teach them. Mm -hmm. They cannot uh, analyze why you have to use that, so they cannot develop the sentences. Right. They have a very bad experience teaching those. Yeah, it, so it's a big challenge, isn't it? But I think one of the best things about learning a second language is that you actually learn your first language at a deeper level. Right? When you start to understand grammar in a second language, then you can go back and say, ah, that's what we do in our language, right? Yeah. Um, I lived in Brazil for a long time, and I studied Portuguese there. And that's where I did my master's and my doctorate. So I had to write my thesis and my dissertation in Portuguese. And so I really had to learn Portuguese grammar. But I learned a lot about English grammar while I was learning Portuguese grammar. Because honestly, my English grammar was not that good. But honestly, it's interesting. In the United States, they don't teach grammar very well at the schools. They really don't. You don't need to learn. What? You don't need to learn grammar. That is your language. Not if you're going to you right? If you speak, you, Usually native speakers don't like make a lot of mistakes. They might make some depending on their level of education, right? But you can survive without learning grammar in your L1, can you? It happens all the time. But if you want to be educated, if you want to write very well, you should know grammar in your L1. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. But you do learn it, don't you? Have you had that experience? Yes. You learn more about your L1 grammar? What are some other things that you can transfer from Vietnamese to English? Vietnamese and English had the, the same uh, romance skirt. And it's kind of okay. easy for Vietnamese learner to look at words and, and and one more thing is that Vietnamese has a structure of subject and verb. Okay. Whereas Korean or Japanese they have different structure. Okay. Right. So Vietnamese has subject, verb, object, yeah. the same order that we do in English? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, that's a perfect example. Great. It's really hard when you try and learn a language with another script. Right? You have to start with the alphabet. If you're going to study Russian, you have to learn a whole new script, right? Great. So that helps us with reading. We can pronounce words. Another interesting thing is about the conjunctions. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of conjunctions too when we talk. And in English, we also learn the conjunctions. But um, there are something different, like the word in Vietnamese, we, we always use the pairs, although and but, although but, they go together. But in English, if you say but, don't say no. And if they say no, they say but. Right. I don't prepare because so. In Vietnamese, we always say because and then so. Uh -huh. But they go together. So, so yeah, is that a positive or negative? Yeah, that is negative. Yeah. negative. Yeah, negative. But, right, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, very good. So it's positive in the fact that you have them and you're able to use them. But then it becomes negative if you don't use them correctly, so right? Yeah. As teachers, we have to show them that, okay, if they say because, don't say but. Uh, don't say so. And if they say so, don't say but. Unless, uh, although, don't say but. It is but the problem. That's interesting. Sure. I had a Korean student. She would always say, but however. <laughs> <laughs> but however. Yeah. <laughs> no, once it up. <laughs> Maybe she's from Vietnamese. <laughs> And then she's I Korean, but maybe Korean yeah. has the same thing. That's what it made me realize. Like thinking, ah, oh, that's why she did that. Yeah. That's not. I guess we want to do reason. We use the reason a lot because yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, positive transfer is an area that makes it easier, right? It's something that you have in similar to the your native language, so it's easier, right? And negative transfer occurs where the two areas are different, so it's harder, right? Because it's usually a new thing that you're learning. Okay. So we talked about, um, another one of the famous um, behaviorists is Pavlov. He didn't really study language, but he was also a famous behaviorist. What did he study? Do you remember? What? Dolphins. Dogs, yeah. What did he do with the dogs? Uh, at first time, he knew the dog and had the boundary and the lighter, the lighter time, he just read the bells but didn't read the bell. Uh, the dog was still a few um, light to eat. Yeah, the dog would salivate, right? But his mouth would water because he was thinking about the bone. But he didn't have the bone, just the bell made him salivate, right? So that's who Skinner based his ideas on. Because you could see that you could substitute something, that you could teach a behavior like that. So that was the stimulus and response, right? So in behaviorism, they saw language as a habit. It was habit formation. You just learn something by repetition. That's how the dogs learn to salivate, is by forming a habit. So the book gave this example of a child that says something like, Daddy bringed it. And then the mommy says, no, you must say, Daddy brought it. You can't say, Daddy bringed it. But in fact, do parents usually do this? Not really, right? I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think? We don't say no. You must say no. We just we just say the correct way. And then right. The child will follow. Exactly. And we don't say no. Okay, that's not right. Okay, we don't say so. no. We don't. Parents usually don't correct their children's grammar unless they're English teachers. <laughs> <laughs> the English teachers will do it, right? right? But in general, parents don't correct their children's grammar. So this was a flaw in Skinner's theory is that parents don't do that, they don't correct it. So how does the child learn that? 
it wasn't a question of stimulus and response. Right? So sometimes parents correct, sometimes they don't, but the child still learns the correct form eventually. We usually use what you say, uh, recasting, right? You, you would say, oh, daddy brought it, right? So you want to model the correct thing, but we usually don't tell them overtly. This is how to correct it. OK, so somebody mentioned Lado when I was talking about um, Skinner. And so Lado came up with the idea of um, contrastive analysis. So he was publishing in 1957. That was a little bit later than Skinner, so he did come after Skinner. I think that it's important for you to know the major theorists and approximately when they were publishing. You should have an idea of when they were prominent. It's a study of history, and looking at history, it's important to kind of know what's going on in the world. What was going on in the 1950s? What was culture like? What were people like? What were the political events like? So you can kind of have a better idea of what life was like and how people were thinking. So tell me about contrastive analysis. What do you remember about that? Are you guys getting too cold? Do, should we turn the air conditioning down? Can you turn it down a little? Oops, not me. No, the air conditioner.